Shalom from Jerusalem, and welcome to this Mizrahi TV wine tasting program for Tu Bishvat. I'm David Weinberg, came on Aliyah 30 years ago and developed a passion for Israeli fruit, especially grapes and the fine wines made for them. On this show, we're going to meet five Israeli wineries, talk to their winemakers, and taste their wines, the very best that Israel has to offer. We'll meet winemakers from Flam, Shiloh, Castel, Yatir, and Tepperberg wineries. You're welcome to taste these wines along with us. If you have some of them at home, they're available all across the Jewish world. But before we begin, let me tell you what excites me so much about Israeli wine. And it's this. There are divine echoes in every glass of Israeli wine. Torah tells us, going back to Yaakov Avinu, who blessed Shevet Yehuda, that his portion of the land of Israel would be so soaked with wine that their eyes would be red. And of course, the Jewish people has promised that like the days of old, Vayeshev Yehuda v'Yisrael lavetach ish tachat teinatov, ish tachat gafnov, midan v'ad Beersheva, that the Jewish people will live safely in security in its land from Dan to Beersheva, each under his fig tree and each under his vine. Ashreinu shezachinu lekach, how truly fortunate we are to be living in a dor geula, a time of redemption, when these prophecies are coming true. Let's meet the first one of these enthusiastic, hardworking, and brilliant young Israeli winemakers. Here we are in the uh, 2,000 barrel strong barrel room at Tepperberg Winery, one of the country's largest and finest wineries, producing over 7 million bottles a year, exporting to the entire Jewish world. With us today, we're fortunate to have some time with Daddy Friedenberg, uh, one of the leading winemakers here at Tepperberg. Uh, Danny's been in Israel, an American Aleph, for about 10 years, and he's been here at Tepperberg for the last six. Great to have you with us today, Danny. Pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for hosting us. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into winemaking. Well, as uh, all the pa good pathways of life, you never really know what's going to bring you. So I was a good pre-med student in NYU before I made Aliyah, and uh, I loved biology. But towards the end of my studies there, I really wanted to connect with botany and other interests of mine. So I started moving into the plant physiology world. And when I made Aliyah, I went to, after my short army service, I went to Hebrew University and got a master's in plant sciences. And from there, things rolled off into the vineyards with some research in 
the vine in fruit sciences and grape clusters, and that's how I made my way into the wine industry of Israel. So it's a direct extension of your professional scientific interests. What excites you the most about actually making wine? So it's the unification of both the sciences with the art. And that's what I love so much is, and then you can see that in all different life forms and biology and even chemistry, the world sciences, is there's this beautiful art hidden in it and wine just brings that out to full expression. That's fantastic. And as an immigrant to Israel, as an ole, this for you is Aliyah, after Aliyah, after Aliyah, till... Abs absolutely. Uh, when I first came to Israel to study in Yeshiva, I started to see the agricultural world of Israel, and I always heard about all the advances that Israel has contributed to the world in agriculture, and just feeling so close to it. Growing from where I grew up in New York, you, you don't really know where your food's coming from, and to see that when you're traveling on the highways here, just to see the produce growing, and the hands in it was one aliyah after another and to actually be a part of it in the grape wine world of Israel is really tremendous. And you've joined a family-owned winery which goes back to 1870, if I'm not mistaken, which is a powerhouse, an empire really, in the kosher winemaking world. How do you find your place in this empire? Well, I'm humbled to be a part of this uh, tremendous empire of a winery, 150 years. We just, we just celebrated 150 years in this winery. And every year there's a tremendous growth in terms of style and production. And to be a part of the winemaking team here, obviously I'm, I have a wonderful colleague, Shiki and Olivier. They have so much experience and knowledge to share and I'm humbled to be a part of this process with the Tepperberg Winery. Okay, so you're a humble guy, tell us why you've chosen this wine for us to learn about and taste today. So I chose today Cabernet Sauvignon uh, from our Essence series. Uh, everyone loves Cabernet Sauvignon throughout the world. Um, and I think that we have an opportunity to showcase a beautifully crafted Cabernet from two different regions that are blended here. So this is from our Essence series, which is a premier series of ours. We have a few different red varietal wines in this series. And the Cabernet Sauvignon, as I mentioned before, in this, in this uh, wine comes from two different regions. One is in the Upper Galilee, and the second region is in the Shiloh region. Okay, so one, the, in the Shiloh region, we're talking about 450 meters above sea level, and in the Upper Galilee, we're talking 650 meters above sea level. Both of them offer different aspects of Cabernet Sauvignon to make a more harmonious blend for What us. does the sea level mean? What, how does that impact on the grapes? Absolutely, so it's so important when we're talking about a Mediterranean climate in particular to have a great difference in temperatures between day and night. It allows the grapes to cool off from this Mediterranean climate and really just ripen at the right processing rates to make the great fruit flavors and textures in the wine. And so altitude gives us that ability. Uh, so we know that the higher you up you go in our regions, the cooler evenings that you're gonna have, and that's what's gonna produce high quality and wine. you're blending grapes from two different vineyards here, as you said, in two vocations, because what? That gives you? So in the Shiloh region, we're gonna get a little bit more earthiness and ripeness to the fruit profile of the Cabernet. And in the Upper Galilee, we're gonna get a little more restraint uh, and texture. That's what I believe that we're gonna contribute from these two blends. This is something we've been working with for many years now in this series. And we see that these vineyards together produce a stellar Cabernet. Okay, that's wonderful. So tell me what we ought to, uh Smell and taste as we... Uh... So as you can see, I opened up the wine well before you even got here. This is a 2017, so it's quite young uh, for, for this Cabernet in this series. I wanted it to give time to breathe. And that essentially means that we're gonna, after all the time, first of all, spend 18 months in barrel, in new French oak barrels, and then uh, over a half a year in bottle before we release it to the market. So we really need to give the wine a time to open up, to be ready to appreciate the aromas and flavor profile as well. So someone who has the Tepperberg Essence Cabernet 2017 at home can hold it for a couple years yet? Absolutely, absolutely. This is just gonna be released to the market in, this, um, in the States now, where I think we're finishing up in the 2016 vintage. So this is just coming onto the market? Yes, absolutely. So, swirl our glasses, 
to release some of the aromas, to incorporate a little more oxygen into the wine, to really release what we want to experience in flavor. And you can already smell it from here. The time that we had it open really helped it. The fruit profile is really coming out. So of course we always uh, like to look at the color of the wine and you can see that it has quite a deep garnet color. Uh, up against the white background. Up against the white background, of course, yes. Otherwise, I'll get some blue notes from your jacket if I look at it that way. Um, And we, when we move to the aroma, we can start to smell the aromas of the flu, of the fruit, excuse me, some of the dark. Brown berries, maybe? A little bit of light berries as well, some dark berries as well, some blackberry, cranberry, absolutely. And there's this refreshing characteristic of it that's a little bit eucalyptus, menthol, that kind of gives it a nice lift on top of all that fruit. It's so fruity on the nose that I would almost guess that this is a Merlot. <laughs> Yes, Merlots can often be very fruity as well, but I find the Merlots to be a little bit more red fruit in character. Mm -hmm. And here we're getting a little more of those darker notes. Uh, we like to get in the Cabernet. It's going to be nice and rich. And we like to use all of our senses, as you know. So when we're going to go taste this now, we're also going to, when we put it in our palate, we move it around. And it's not just taste, but it's also mouthfeel and textures as well. And you're going to feel the structure of the wine and how it sits on your palate. So I had another glass of wine before we started this session on which I made the bracha borei priyagefen. So this gives me an opportunity now to make an additional bracha, perot eretz Yisrael, wines from Israel, an upgraded wine as opposed to what I drank beforehand and um, a wine that wasn't on my table beforehand. Baruch atah Adonai, uheinu melech haram, hatov v'ametiv. That bracha, of course, is when it comes to foods, only on wine and only on wines grown and produced in Eretz Yisrael. Wow. Totally fills your mouth. I feel the sides of my tongue tingling. Almost has a somewhat sweet finish to it, which is surprising for, for Cabernet. That dark fruit really fills the mid palate there. And in terms of what you're feeling on the sides of your mouth, we have these mouth coating tannins, but they're still nice and soft. You can have tannins that are a little underripe and they can be more chalky. Here you feel that they're nicely coating your mouth and this definitely deserves a nice meal along with this wine, because this is an opulent wine that really could use uh, some rich dish. Uh, you have the steaks on the grill coming up, us, Coming up in just uh, a few minutes, room, yes. medium <laughs> rare, right? So uh, No, well done only. <laughs> um, we'll switch up your order. Uh, absolutely, the, the mouth coating tannins of this wine really give uh, structure and, a long, and the vibrant acidity here gives a nice long finish uh, to all the fruit profile that we have on it as well. And the only way to really learn the difference between, as you say, a Malbec, Syrah, Merlot, or any of the blends is just to Taste drink. side by side even. Not just to drink, but to taste side by side. One of the most eye-opening experiences that I ever had when I first started drinking wine was to have multiple cups in front of me. I mean, not everyone can do that all the time, but if you get together with friends, God willing, we'll all be able to get together real soon together with other, with other people and drink together. Uh, to have multiple glasses, to open up different bottles and to really just try, even if it's not the same variety, just to compare even different regions. It's uh, wonderful to have something because our memory is limited to some extent. And so really this is how we open up our mind, open up our palate and uh, learn learn our different wines. So you, Danny, live relatively nearby, up in the Jerusalem mountains, in the Moshav Kisalon, young family, um, your kids growing up speaking English and Hebrew um, at home. Uh, do they understand what their father does for a living? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, my wife was just in uh, Makolet uh, nearby, and my daughter saw a Temerberg on the shelves, and she started 
screaming to my, to my wife, look, 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 look what they have here. So she's very familiar. And does she know how to drink? And she knows how to smell. She she's not smell. drinking yet, but she definitely, every wine that we open, pass the glass to her, ask her to smell, tell me what she smells, and then she'll just repeat something I said. But, you know, it's about opening up that experience and know she's very familiar. Yes, absolutely. That's great. So that gives hope for all of us that we have a chance yet to learn, understand, appreciate. Perot Eretz Yisrael, Yenot Eretz Yisrael. Thank you, Danny. L'chaim Tovim Roshalom. L'chaim to Tepperberg. When you're in the vineyard, especially first light in the morning, when you're alone, there's something in the air. There are times when I'm working in the vineyards, I'm tending a certain vine. I can actually feel the roots from my legs, from my body, into the ground. I feel part of the land itself. Imagine that amazing feeling. You planted a vine in Israel and then five years later you're drinking wine from that vineyard and then 20 years later you're drinking that wine at your son's wedding. It's something that fills you in so many ways, fills your heart. We're here in the mountains surrounding Jerusalem with a very special guest, Amichai Luria, chief winemaker of Shiloh Winery. Shiloh, of course, being in the mountains north of Yerushalayim, place where the Mishkan once stood, a very unique winery. Amichai, you've been there since the very beginning, since 2005. Um, from the first vintage, yeah. From the very first vintage, and uh, you grow your grapes in the Shomron, and produce wine in the Shilo Valley. Uh, great to have you with us here today. Thank you very much. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Making wine is not just uh, a profession, it's also a passion. It's something that uh, I feel it's an honor to be doing what I'm doing. Uh, growing grapes in uh, Eretz Israel, it's literally prophecies coming true. So growing grapes and making wine in the place where our ancestors used to make wine 2,000 and 3,000 years ago is a privilege and an honor and also a lot of fun. <laughs> and um, thank God things are going very well. You're literally in the biblical heartland, right at the center of uh, the action from the times of uh, Yeshua. Shoftim, I live, in, I live in Ma'ale Levona, which is right next to Shiloh. The valley between Ma'ale Levona and Shiloh, that's where the first war of the Maccabim was. Um, Shiloh was the capital of Eretz Israel before King David and before Yerushalayim. This is where everything started. And um, our Nevi'im, our prophets, when they spoke about the day will come and we will come back to Eretz Yisrael, they were talking specifically about this area. It's like, you know, you have to be blind not to see what's happening. And uh, it's a great privilege. So 20 years on, um, Shiloh is known for its robust, very round and full wines. You're now producing over a dozen, almost maybe two dozen different, uh, different labels, primarily growing Cabernet. Merlot, Merlot. Shiraz, Cabernet Franc, uh, Petit Syrah, Petit Verdot, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Granache, a lot of different varietals and uh, we're planting more and more every year. Uh, just the past two years, we planted over 100 dunam. Hopefully this year, the last year before Shemitah, that we still have a chance to plant, uh, we'll be planting some more. Uh, we planted Barbera, 
It's a big success, the Barbero wine that we make. Uh, we planted last year and the year before, and hopefully this coming year, if all goes well. So I'll tell our listeners that uh, Amichai is a uh, social media master. You can find him cooking um, outstanding meats and drinking it with his wine in dozens and dozens of videos online. He usually makes me uh, very jealous. And uh, his winery, Shiloh, has become uh, quite prominent on the uh, North American kosher wine market. You'll find him everywhere. Amichai, let's move to our tasting. What, what are we drinking today? So we're going to be tasting two different wines. We'll taste our new 2020 rosé. By the way, the gift set comes with a bookmark. And we'll also be tasting uh, the Shiraz Secret Reserve. This is a wonderful wine for a summer day or a clear, uh, crisp, crisp <laughs> winter day. What, what, do we, uh, what do we have on the nose here? Citrus fruits. Strawberries. Interesting. Pear. Yes. Pear and strawberries, right? Maybe even uh, like a green apple to it. Well, this is the, the first sip of the day. L'chaim. L'chaim, tovim wa shalom. Baruch. Delicious. So, Amichai, let's move on to uh, tasting the second bottle you've kindly brought for us today. This is the Shiloh Secret Reserve Shiraz 2017. It's a pure Shiraz, correct? Yes. Aged for 18 months, French oak barrels. Yes. And uh, I've been a fan of Syrah Shiraz for, for many years. Uh, I love that varietal. We use it in a lot of different wines. Uh, first of all, the exclusive edition mosaic has a Syrah in it. Almost every year, but not every year, we have a secret reserve uh, Shiraz. Uh, Legend Fiddler, one of our biggest hits for many years, uh, is Petit Syrah, Petit Verdot and Shiraz. So we're a big fan. We just planted another vineyard of uh, Shiraz, uh, five dunam. Now this is a much uh, bigger and bolder wine, of course. Yeah, so a Shiraz, in my opinion, has to be very fruity, very big. And I think the challenge with the Shiraz is to be able to, on the one hand, make it very round and smooth. And on the other hand, um, we will make a Shiraz Seeker Reserve only if I can get that multi-layered flavors and aromas in the wine. And that's why not every year I said I nailed it. How many bottles would you have produced uh, in a, of this? A couple of thousand, anywhere between uh, two, three thousand to ten thousand bottles. Never more in this uh, series. We have, a ch we have a chance here to make uh, an additional bracha, don't we? Uh, I think it's without Shem and Malchut because, because we knew it was here, it was here. But uh, to say Baruch Ata, Tov Ametiv, it's always good to have the attitude of gratitude, right? Nechaim. Nechaim. To me, this is a, um, a, a chillant wine uh, for Shabbat. A, um, a bold, powerful, round, fruity, almost tastes like a Merlot uh, Shiraz um, that would pair beautifully with a, a deep stew, like Shabbos chillant. And it has a, 
it's so powerful that it can cut through almost anything. It means even if you have a smoked brisket or something like that, and you need something really powerful to pair with it, this will pair with it perfectly. And the Gemara says there's a pasuk in Yechezkel, uh, Ve'atem Hare Yisrael, right, in back of us. Anpechem titnu ufiriechem tis'u le'ami Yisrael ki karvu lavo. Ki karvu lavo. When you see that after thousands of years, right, the, the land here was, there was nothing here. People try to grow things here. People try to live here. Nothing stuck. Eretz Yisrael didn't welcome anybody. When we're not here, then nobody else is welcome. But as the Jewish people returns as to its ancestral homeland, the land of Israel is giving of its fruits. And this is what I say. People. So when I get fruit like this, when fruit like this, uh, when our vineyards yield this amazing shiraz, then I say, wait a second, I, there's a promise in the Gemara, and you can feel it. You can feel that, uh, that promise uh, coming true. No more beautiful word for Tu Bishvat. Tu Bishvat Sameach. Thank you, Amichai. Mechaim. Of Shiloh. Mechaim Tovim. Drink Shalom. wine from Eretz Israel and Tu Bishvat. There's enough uh, things that grow in Eretz Israel that you can eat and drink all around the world. Lechaim. Ben Zaken, the chief winemaker, the proprietor at Domaine du Castel, the Castel winery in the Judean hills in Yad Hashmona. In my view, uh, the most beautiful uh, winery in the country uh, with the, a sublime visitor center where we're sitting now. Um, a boutique winery that grows all its grapes here in the Judean mountains. A truly a state winery, a family boutique winery. Uh, Ellie, welcome. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate uh, your hosting us here very much. Thank you for having me. Your whole family is engaged here in the winery. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, challenging, but rewarding. <laughs> and you yourself are 75 years old, I believe. 76. 76. Uh, Born in Egypt, um, made your way through Italy, He's been here in Israel for about 50 years now. Great Britain and uh, Switzerland. Right. And this winery is, what, 25 years old now? Oh, more. Uh, first wine was made in 92, so uh, this year it will be the 30th vintage. Many people credit you and uh, the Grand Vin of Castel, your flagship wine, with the breakthrough, the international breakthrough um, for Israeli wines into the international market, uh, into international reg recognition. And you have uh, vineyards planted 
within several kilometers of this winery in Malaya Hamisha, in Tsuba, and where else? Uh, in the Veilan. Veilan. But uh, we are plant, plant, we... All here in the uh, Jerusalem corridor, corridor, the yeah. corridor leading up from Sharagai to Jerusalem. To Jerusalem, yes, from starting from 500 meters altitude up to 800. Tell us, uh, please, about the, the wine you've selected for uh, us today. I selected the, the, the Chardonnay Si Blanc du Castel. Uh, this we made also in 98 for the first time. Uh, three barrels. And, uh, and the result was uh, a big surprise. I liked it very much. And uh, since we make more, of course. This is an oaked or an unoaked? Sure. It's oaked. It's an oaked. I think it's an heresy to make an unoaked Chardonnay. Uh, I like to describe Chardonnay as the uh, the most red of the white grapes because it's uh, it has body, uh, it has length, uh, it ages very well, and uh, we have Chardonnays of the of. Uh, the beginning of the century, which we are, we are drinking uh, with pleasure now. Uh, and I think that uh, it's the, the redder, the reddish, no, the most red wine, uh, red, red grape of the white grapes. That means you really can treat it as a, as a, uh, as a red grape. Also, it's, you can have a lot of dishes with it. So you would you would drink the Chardonnay even with a meat meal? Uh, certainly with chicken, and uh, certainly uh, with veal, and uh, and uh, with fish. Uh, best better than a red wine with cheese, and uh, it's really. Uh, also, it's mouth filling and long, and, uh, and with a good acidity, it invites the next bite. And you're making me thirsty. Let's. Uh... And I also always think, say that if I uh, if I had to choose only one bottle to take on a desert island, uh, this is the one I would take. <laughs> okay, uh, this is our desert island wine. So this grows in um, in Suba. You know the old joke about the Jew who ended up on a desert island, and uh, when they came to rescue him, they saw that he had built two shuls, two synagogues, and they asked him why. He said, "Because there's one I go to and one I don't go to." But uh, so this is the bottle that you would drink on the desert island. Definitely. My descriptions are usually: is it, is it mouth filling? If it has a middle palate, that means from what you've tasted at the beginning and what will be left at the end, if there is something in the middle. Mid palate is very, more, very, very important in a wine. Uh, if it li li because always you have a taste when you come, the wine. First hit, taste. Yeah. First, first ent entry on your, on your lips and, and tongue. You have something after swallowing at the end. So an aftertaste, yes. Yeah, and, and the aftertaste. And if you don't have something in the middle, which is on the tongue, uh, middle pa mid palate, uh, it, it's not good. So this is, uh, so this is first, the first thing I'm looking for. If it has a good acidity, if the, the blend is, is harmonious and well balanced, and then, you know, the things you can find, the lychee you can find today, you might not find it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it's fruity or not fruity, even without this, trying to find out which fruit it is. And uh, so, uh, harmony, which is very, very important. A good backbone of acidity in a white wine. And uh, if, it's, if I like it. 
לחיים. חיים טובים ושלום ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם פרי פרי הגפן. Definitely mouth filling. Long. You can click your tongue on your palate. Almost has a creamy um, texture to it. Yes, velvety, yeah. This is, these are the things I like. Uh, I, li I, I like to describe and look for because uh, All, all uh, if, if a wine has these things, which is really very short description, it's not a, not a taste thing, but you have in your mouth uh, a feeling that is thicker than, uh, let's that say, water, is, yes. than water. But it's not thick. Uh, it's, uh, it has a presence in your mouth. My final question to you, uh, Ellie, is with the perspective that you have going back almost three decades and uh, having watched the Israeli wine world develop, where do you see Israeli wines 30 years forward? It's very difficult to tell. Uh, we have a basic problem that we are very small. And, uh, small market. No, we are no, we are a very small country, and so we cannot produce millions and millions of bottles. Uh, we produce, but let's say uh, 300, 300 million, 500 million. Uh, countries who who can do that: New Zealand, Australia, Argentina, Argentina, and uh, Chile uh, have uh, conquered foreign markets by putting very cheap wines, uh, selling them very cheap wines, which were sold by the glass uh, very cheaply in bars, in pubs in England, and uh, so that the public got to know that there is a Chilean wine, that there is an Australian wine, that uh, uh, New Zealand wine, so we know it's fantastic. Uh, so we don't have the capacity of conquering markets that way. That means of letting the world know what is Israel. Right. So Israel's not aimed at mass markets, but rather at... Yes, but mass, mass market makes your, your name, your popularity, your, uh, uh, attracts uh, uh, the curiosity of people to go and buy Uh, first, the cheaper wine, and then the more expensive wine. And this is, uh, we're not at, it's a curiosity to be an Israeli wine. Uh, I had a, a wine shop in Paris who, who, when I asked him, how do you sell, a, at the time, the wine was not kosher, uh, a 50 euro wine to a Frenchman. It's very expensive, 50 euro for a Frenchman. A Frenchman buys a wine for four euros, 10 at the most. If it's a birthday, 15. He said, I, just, I tell them, if you want a, a 100 euro Bordeaux for 50. <laughs> Buy the Israeli wine. <laughs> so really, it, it is not easy, and unfortunately, uh, Nobody has found yet the, the solution to, to go, get out, really get out of the kosher market uh, abroad. To grow beyond the kosher market, yeah. You, Ellie, should be uh, indeed very proud uh, that you have created uh, an iconic um, Israeli winery. Um, Castel is associated with excellence and regularly is ranked as one of the best Israeli wines. It's been a pleasure and honor for us to be here today. I wish you good health and success as, as you go forward and uh, continue filling our Shabbat tables with uh, the best. I drink to that. Perot Eretz Yisrael. Once again, l'chaim. 
Absolutely magnificent. Thank you. These are all French oak? Yes. And you're using only new French oak? Uh, no, uh -huh. uh, but every year we buy uh, over 300 barrels. Every year? Yeah. We have... Uh, and how many barrels are in this room? Uh, nearly 1,500. Absolutely beautiful. And the, uh, you, the caps are glass. Yes, uh, traditional, uh, traditional caps. They're called bungs. Bungs. The uh, smell in this room is intoxicating without even drinking the wine. And these are all barrels from the same cooperage in yeah. uh, France? Yes. This is uh, David. Don't touch, please. OK. Shalom, Vracha. And you're doing what at the moment? Vivrit. Vivrit, Mata Osekarega? Topping. Topping. So you're topping up the barrels, meaning that you are Filling the barrels to make sure that there's no air. And Ellie, why is it that we want no air in the barrel at all? Uh, because, uh, it, it's a long uh, lecture. <laughs> the barrel does three things. One, depending on how new it is, it gives you taste yes. of the wood. Second, it concentrates it because some of the volume goes to what the French call the part of the angels. And evaporation. Evaporation. Yes. And that means concentrating. And the third thing is that you get a little oxygen, but very, very little. Uh, Which comes through the wood. Through and the wood. you're topping up the barrel to make sure there's not too much oxygen yes. in the barrel. Fascinating. Thank you. This is truly a magnificent empire that you, uh, you. you have here. Bracha v'atzacha. Also, the wine knows where it lives. Friends, hi, we're at the uh, Flam Winery in the Kedoshim Forest near Shar Haggai in the Jerusalem foothills. And we're here with Golan Flam, uh, chief winemaker of uh, Flam. And we're going to be tasting one of his finest wines uh, today. Golan, tell us about uh, Flam. Okay, so uh, actually, Flam Winery, Flam is our family name. And uh, I can say that we are uh, one of the oldest uh, wine families in Israel, in this uh, very young country. Uh, actually, I was born in South Africa while my father was studying winemaking. So actually, I was born into wine. Your father is Israel Flam, one Israel of the Flam, uh, legendary Israeli winemakers. Yeah, my father uh, used to be the chief winemaker of Carmel for almost uh, 40, 40 years. And uh, my brother, myself, and our mother, we decided to create, uh, to create Flam Winery in 1998 uh, in a different way, in a way, to create a boutique winery which will focus on uh, top quality grapes which we grow in the Judan Hills, and uh, our oldest plots are in the Upper Galilee. 
And uh, since then, we are already working 22 years, and since then, we are still, uh, our main ambition is to make the best wines we can make from the top uh, vineyards in Israel. And yet, Flam has a distinct um, character um, to its winemaking that is associated with you and your personality and your vision. In two words or less, tell us about it. Okay, so actually, I was studying winemaking in Italy. And uh, then I, I traveled to Australia, but I think that uh, I'm most influenced in, till today from the European style and I'm looking for the elegance uh, or in a way to work in these two uh, extremes of uh, uh, boldness and elegance. So if we taste this uh, Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve, we can really have the idea that I'm looking to bring into my wines, which, uh, which is to create uh, power and elegance on the, same, uh, on the same way. So in just a moment, we are going to be tasting um, the Flam Cabernet Sauvignon 2018 Reserve. Um, both the bottle itself and its design as well as the winery, which you can see a little bit around us here, all have the same elegant design to them. And uh, for those of you who are interested, the uh, glasses we'll be drinking from are what known as the Zalto glass, a very delicate, elegant wine that allows the wine to breathe, um, both widthwise and vertically. This wine is the finest expression from your perspective of what? Well, Cabernet Sauvignon uh, is one of my favorite varieties. Uh, I ex my first experience, by the way, with Cabernet Sauvignon was in Tuscany while I was, after finishing my studies in Piacenza University, I went to work in Tuscany in uh, Grevy in Chianti. And uh, in those days, Cabernet Sauvignon was quite new in uh, Tuscany and uh, wineries created over there the Super Toscan wines, which were the same idea that I'm trying to make here in, in Israel. The, the top wines for Toscan used to be f made from Cabernet Sauvignon uh, with a little bit of Sangiovese, but this wine is uh, powerful and on the same, same time is uh, long and elegant. So we can see if we put it on top of uh, the napkin. We have a beautiful, deep, uh, ruby uh, uh, color. So what we're doing here is comparing the color of the wine up against a white uh, background. To check for its texture, its depth, its color. Of course, if it looks brownish, then you know the wine is past its prime. And, uh, and this is not the case here. And uh, 2018 was beautiful vintage, uh, almost perfect. You know, we, we in these kind of uh, vintages, we're trying not to harm nature. So uh, we picked, I picked the grapes in perfect maturity. Uh, the grapes were grown on the upper Galilee on uh, volcanic soils uh, on 830 meters above sea level. And this wine was aged for uh, 15 months in uh, French oak. I'm trying to work with a very delicate balance with the French oak. 40% new oak, all the rest is one year old and two year old to give, to respect the fruit. And um, then I leave it in another few months in the bottle. So now when after two, three years, we can really enjoy. And this could hold in the bottle for a number of years yet. For at least 10 years. Uh, so those of you who've managed to buy uh, this particular uh, reserve series in this bottle, you can hold on to it for uh, quite some time, but it is ready for drinking now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, very nice. It has these uh, silky tannins uh, with still a lot of uh, black currant fruit on the nose. And uh, on the other hand, the wine can age beautifully another seven, eight, or 10 years. Depends on the personal taste of the wine lover, which will drink it. Now, so let's test, taste the, 
test the note. Chaim. Chaim. So I'm getting black currents, and. Um, You can feel the very delicate um, cedar wood uh, with uh, a bit of uh, the wood is under under the fruit, so the fruit is is in the center, but you can feel the delicate French oak on the background, and uh, yeah, I could sniff this for another hour before. Yeah, and it's all the time it evolves and develops uh, beautifully in the glass. Okay, let's taste it. Chaim Tov. Lechaim. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Pri Agaf. Amen. You'll excuse our slurping, but that is part of the um, tasting process to swirl the wine around in the mouth especially around the taste buds that are on the end of your tongue and get a, its full flavor. What, uh, what are we tasting here? So we have um, medium plus to full body wine. Uh, it really fills all the, the mouth and, and the palate. Yeah, very round. But it's still, it's very silky and round. This is what I'm looking in my winemaking to, to uh, bring this beauty of the grape, this grape of Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and so you can really have a very deep, uh, deep feeling on the palate, but still it will not, um, uh, the tannins will not be aggressive tannins. Sometimes with Cabernet Sauvignon, we have these very aggressive tannins. But Which gives you a bitter aftertaste in the mouth, right? Exactly. But here I'm looking for the roundness, for the silkiness, and for the longevity, not to make a blockbuster, or to make it very long. And uh, you can still, after swirling and, uh, uh, and drinking the wine, you will feel it another 60, 70 seconds on the palate. So this is a great um, Shabbat meal wine. Um, go really well with uh, roasted meats. Yeah, yeah, it would be beautiful with uh, roasted meat. That's or... one of the things about uh, wines. Uh, the wines take on their character to some degree from the food that you are uh, eating them with and the, the, the juices of the meat in your mouth together with the uh, tannins on the wine here produce a beautiful combination. It will upgrade the food and the food will upgrade the wine. This is the perfect combination between food and wine. Okay. Go on, in conclusion, please tell our friends um, what it is about winemaking in Israel that excites you the most. Tell, tell me about yourself. Well, I think I'm lucky enough uh, to be one of the um, Pioneers, I think, in the new era of Israel uh, winemaking that we, we are discovering in those days. I'm planting new vineyard in uh, the Judean Hills. Uh, I'm rev revealing or reviving this land after centuries of, uh, of uh, years that people didn't touch this land. And I have, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm have the honor, and uh, I'm very, very lucky to be the one which will plant again uh, these great varieties of Cabernet, Syrah, Petit Verdon, very, very old terraces in Evan Sapir uh, vineyard near, very, very close to Jerusalem, on a very old terraces, and. I, uh, I don't know yet what will be the result. I'm, I'm, I hope we will have a great wine from there and we will meet in uh, four or five years and we will taste the wine from Evan Sapir. But I feel very, very lucky to be the one who planting the vineyards on these old terraces after 3,000 or 2,000 years that nobody touched this land. And uh, I 
I hope uh, we will drink this wine in few years and we will be very, very happy to drink this wine. That's very exciting. You can be sure that we'll be back a couple years from now to tape, taste the wines growing in your newly planted vineyards here in the Judean Hills. You know that Chazal teach Haro'eh, Arei Yehuda Bechur Banan, Chayav Likroa, someone who sees the cities of the mountains of Judea in destruction actually has to tear Kriya as if he's sitting Shiva. How lucky are we that we see Arei Yehuda Bivinyanam rebuilt and the mountains giving forth their beautiful fruit to the indigenous Jewish people here in Eretz Yisrael, here in Medinat Yisrael. Thank you, Golan, for Thank you. teaching us so much today. L'chaim. L'chaim. <laughs>
Um, we're going to be tasting one of uh, Yatir's newest blends today. Tell us a little bit more about yourself, Yaakov, before we get to our wine. Oh. <laughs> you know, the days of uh, Tu Bishvat take me, took me to my family. Uh, for us, it was very important every year. In uh, my grandmother and my grandfather, they was uh, Hungarian. For them, it was unbelievable what happened in Israel. For them, Tu Bishvat was very important. We celebrate it every year. And they came to Israel after the war? After, after. Who survived came to Israel. And <clears throat> I born in Nebuch, then in Native Meir, and then in Jerusalem, and then in Birkat uh, Moshe, Malay Adumim, and then uh, somebody called me to go to the mountain. And I leave the high tech and go to be grower. And today, you know, we make some wine, we try. It's a medicine for people. Where they alone to drink a little bit, to be part of. Gdola legima shemekarevet rechokim. We did have the uh, the wildest uh, room in the uh, yeshiva high school dormitory, and. Um, those of you who are truly fascinated by grape growing and Israeli agriculture must go on a tour of the uh, Yatir vineyards and the Yatir forest with Yaakov. He knows every plant, every tree, the botanical history behind each one of them, the biblical history behind each one of them. Uh, absolutely a uh, exciting um, uh, teal to go on. Uh, next time you're here in Israel, look up Yaakov Bendor um, at Yatir. You brought us today um, a red and a white yes. from your uh, new series, Yatir Creek. Tell us about the wine. Yat Creek, Yatir Creek is a blend like most of our wine because we want to reflect and show the characters of Yatir. This is, for me, it's most, the most important part because it's so unique to go up on the mountain above the desert. And it's the junction of three climate, Judean desert, Judean mountain, Negev desert. In the beginning, we grow grapes like 75 ton per hectare. It was table grapes like that. Large it's grapes. like large. And you can stand like the you stand, put big uh, basket, another basket, another basket. You, every one vine, you pick a, a huge amount. In the vineyard, it's like seven ton per hectare, less than 10% in the past. So here today, our target is not the crop, the yield like that. The, the, quality, the, quality, the, quality, the quality. Not the quality, but the quality. I can, I can feel your connection, your deep, almost spiritual connection with the fruit, with the land, which goes into your winemaking. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, and I also, you, you know, I think that in this time, before Tu Bishvat, it's amazing for me because you know that we eat good food from Eretz Israel to say Tovar, it's meod meod, like Kalev, when he go to Hebron, to Hebron, to Hebron in the old way from the Negev to Hebron, it's by the way of the, if they stop to drink a little bit of wine, maybe they... Had they stopped off at your tier winery for wine, <laughs> we would have avoided another 40 years in the desert, you're saying, yeah. Uh, but it's unbelievable, the, the opposite time, it's not months of Av, is Tu Bishvat, okay? Mm -hmm. There, they see the big fig, the big branch. Everything was so good, and they make Lashon Ara on Eretz Israel. Now, all, everything is dominate. 
as the Yerushalmi, the Gemara Yerushalmi say, that from now the grapes begin to take the water of the new year. Something changed between, but they see for the long term. So you're saying? You see the spring will come. I, I think it's a Jewish state of mind. So you're saying? To remember, you are always in the winter, the spring is. So the vineyards are in hibernation, and yet they're already drawing life from the earth. They're already drawing fresh water, winter water, to give them uh, the beginning of, uh, of growth. Uh, the grapes will start coming out within I think, uh, six uh, weeks. Yeah. In about yeah, six I weeks, yeah. and then you'll follow them. You'll you only the begin the begin a sign of the beginning, but you know, it's step by step. And it's then several years till we have yeah. wines ready to drink bottled like this. Okay, great. Let's taste the uh, Yatir Creek Red blend from 2016. I'm really happy to be with you, David. I, it's unbelievable. Yeah, this is a, this is a, lot, a tremendous amount of fun. Yeah. Thank you. First thing off, see right away the very deep, deep color, which is... Yeah. It's one of the, our cocktails. It's very... Which is, uh, which is common for a Syrah. This is not my first glass today, so I don't have to make a bracha. You might. Chaim, tov me mashalom. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pri agafen. This is very powerful. You said this was a more restrained wine, but I find it to be very strong. What, what I mean, what I mean, that here you get the black berries and cassis, but hint of minerality, a little bit salty. You can't, the tannins are there, but soft tannins, mm -hmm. it's not, like, I, I mean, it's not a bomb. Mm -hmm. Tannins um, are a chemical component of wine that gives um, your mouth a, a taste of dryness. You feel the dryness on the sides of your tongue. Those are the tannins, and it prevents it from being um, too sharp. Oh, I... I... Fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I like this Cla way. Classic Syrah. Um, meat meals. Yeah, good. <laughs> you, need, but you need good meat. Good steak. Yeah, good steak, good lamb. And good friends. Ah, it's always. <laughs> this brings today's special TV program on Israeli wine to a close. I think we've all learned that drinking Israeli wine is all about connection. Connection to the land, connection to God, uh, connection to Am Yisrael, connection to friends. I want to thank Rav Doron Perez, Rav Reuven Terrigan, and Rav Hillel Van Leeuwen, the leadership of Mizrahi Oami, for making this special TV program possible and for including me in it. I hope you've enjoyed. L'chaim, tovim u'shalom, b'sorot avot, yeshuot v'nechamot.